Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, welcome to the study. We're going to be continue our reading of A.T. Jones, uh, the 1893 General Conference Bulletin Sermons. And this is the Third Angel's Message uh, series of his, the number 22, Sermon 22. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for the burden that you place upon our hearts, for those around us, and also for ourselves. We need your presence. We know, Lord, that there's so much we do not understand. But we ask, Lord, that you can give us the light we need for each day, that we can clearly see it and that we can walk in it. We pray for those around us, those that we minister to. We also pray for each person who is searching for truth. You know the struggles we face, the pain, the heartache, the guilt, the fear. You know the battle that goes on in each of our hearts. And so we ask, Lord, that you can be there with us and that we can see that you are by our side fighting these battles for us and that we can participate and cooperate with you in these battles. We're thankful for these messages of A.T. Jones from so long ago that are relevant today. And we know, Lord, that uh, we need an understanding of these things, that it's impossible to understand your word without the Holy Spirit that inspired it. And so we ask that your spirit can open to us uh, this message. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in your righteousness. Be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So um, for those who uh, just always do a bit of a review, Jones has been uh, presenting the Sabbath um, in contrast, of course, to the false Sabbath, that is uh, the Christian Sabbath. And of course, uh, the, um, what, what's called the Christian Sabbath, which is you know, the papal Sabbath, and then also, of course, uh, the Jewish Sabbath. And this is the, really the Sabbath of the Lord, the understanding, the true understanding of the Sabbath and what it means. That This is about our characters, not really about a day. Many people keep a day, but they're not keeping the Sabbath at all. And, um, but he's, he's talked about the contrast between how God sees things, God's ideas, and man's ideas. And um, and God's name and what that means. So he's going to be referencing things that he said earlier. He'll do a bit of his own uh, uh, review. So he begins with Isaiah 60, verse 1 to 2. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. A week ago tonight, the text with which the lesson closed was this same one. And you remember the question was asked at the end of the reading of those scriptures, which we were then studying. Is not this the time? Is it not now time for the fulfillment of this text, which we have been reading? Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Our Sunday following, on Sunday following, there came this word, and it was read in the conference. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. This was the point which we had reached by a number of different lines of study, and that is the point where we now stand. He who will claim that light and that glory by faith can have it congregation amen he who does not cannot have it 
I read a passage to you from Brother Prescott's talk the other night on page 444 of the bulletin. It is a word of caution and instruction, which he gave us, that is worth repeating. So um, Prescott wrote or said, it is so easy for us to get wrong ideas about these things, and in that way we ourselves be deceived about it. I have thought that some would have a wrong idea about what is meant when we say that we must go forth in the power of the Spirit, and that we must have power when we shall go forth. <clears throat> and Jones says, so have I, and that has been done. But we had the caution over and over several times at the beginning of the conference against anyone setting any theory or fixing any thought as to how this thing that God had given was to come. So he's talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, of course. Because as certainly as we should think how it was going to come, that is the way it would not come. That is the one way in which it would not come at all. It would not come that way and could not possibly come that way. So uh, Prescott goes on, I do not understand what to mean that we are to come here to be consciously loaded up so that when we go from this place, we have a certain feeling of a conscious power in our own selves that has been given to us and that we have it and carry it with us and can handle it as it were and measure it and look at it and when we need it, take it out and use it. So Jones says, I would not want to guarantee you to you that nobody in this congregation has got that idea about it. I was especially pleased one morning in the minister's meeting, those who were there will remember what I refer to, when one of the brethren got up and gave his testimony in regard to the manifestation of God's blessing and presence during the meetings of this conference, he has jotted them down on paper in a long list. And if every one of you had been marking the tokens of God's special favor in these meetings, instead of looking for something you will never see, you would see vastly more than what you see now. I mean that we are not to have our ideas fixed, that the Lord must work in a certain way, and in that way look for something that will never come. Um, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, lo, I am with you. The power of, is in Christ, not in us, and the having the power is the personal presence of Christ in us, and that's Prescott. So Joan says, and when we have that personal presence of Christ in us and with us, the power is from Christ then and not from us. So, I mean, he's countering this idea that is often the Pentecostal idea of the spirit. You know, that we have the power, we have this Holy Spirit that we can kind of carry around and, and control and manipulate in some ways. But how God's spirit works is not because it's something that we have that God has just given to us. It's actually Christ's presence. It's Christ's character through his spirit that's manifest in us. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It brings Christ to us personally. Um, so um, Joan says, here's a thought. The apostles were not always able to work miracles at will. <clears throat> and he quotes from the life of Paul, page 135. The Lord granted his servants this special power as the progress of his cause or the honor of his name required. A good many people think that when the apostles went out endued with the power to work miracles and all this, that all they had to do when they came to a man who was sick to work a miracle and restore him. There was nothing of that kind at all. They could work no miracle at all, except as the spirit of Christ with them signified the will of God in that case. So that, I care not how great apostles they were, they were dependent upon the direct guidance of the Spirit of God in each individual case and all the time. And that means us. Now, just the thing about miracles. Um, you know, Heidi was anointed in 2016 on July 23rd. And, and, um, and she was healed of her fibromyalgia. It was a miracle, right? Um, now, another person was anointed that day but received no miracle. So it wasn't that Jeff in anointing Heidi and, and uh, Brother Brian, that somehow, you know, Jeff imparted that miracle. It was God's will. 
and God is going to choose what he needs to do for each individual person. And we can't know those things. We can know what God tells us at any given time. Um, but so often, and I don't know how many of you have had much experience with Pentecostals, but they, they take statements of scripture out of context where they believe that they can just command, you know, demons and all this thing sort of at their own will. And um, sometimes, of course, their own will is really just Satan's will. And Satan creates miracles for them, but they aren't redemptive. So, you know, what Christ does in performing miracles is for uh, the progress of his cause or the honor of his name required. So we go, Jones goes on, um, so that I care not how great apostles they were, right? They were dependent upon the direct guidance of the Spirit of God in each individual case and, and all the time. And, and that means us. So we are, of course, under that same, same reality. Now, um, this, so Jones then just uh, quotes here, the power is the personal presence of Christ in us. So he's quoting Prescott. And then he says, and the having the power is that, and that does not necessarily mean in the sense of a thrill of power in us all the time, but it means an abiding faith that Christ is in us. So, of course, we know lots of people look for that thrill, that emotion, that feeling. And it means not only an abiding belief in that, but an abiding consciousness that he is there, that his power is there working in us, with us, for us, through us, always and in all things to the glory of God alone, not at our bidding, not at our guidance in any sense. And then when we go out, no matter what the difficulties are, we are not appalled by them because of the conscious faith that Christ is with us and he is all powerful. Well, when he is with us in the fullness of his power, our faith grasps him continually. It is not a question of feeling the power. It is a question of knowing the power. Now, we have found in our study also that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law in order that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. And what do we find the blessing of Abraham to be? Congregation righteousness. How? Congregation by faith. And Christ redeems us from the curse of the law, that the righteousness which is by faith might come on the Gentiles, that is, on us, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. How did we receive the righteousness, congregation, by faith? And how do and did you have a certain kind of whirl of feeling before you could receive that righteousness? Congregation, no. And did you have a kind of um, whirl of feeling, a thrill, or great commotion before you could know whether that righteousness was yours or not? Congregation, no. How did you obtain the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ? Congregation, by faith and believing his word. You know that God said to you and me in his word, that that is a free gift to every man who believes in Jesus, do you not? And then you accepted that free gift and thank God that his righteousness is your own. That is how you obtain it, and that is faith. Now that was received and can only be received ever by faith alone. Now, the one thing I can say, though, is that there is a peace that comes over a person when you trust in Christ. So it's not a a flight of feeling, a whirling, whirl of feeling, and it's not um, a thrill or commotion. But it, but it, there is a peace that comes when you're reconciled to God. The burden is lifted. But people often want to have this sort of ecstatic experience. Um, that is received by faith in order that something else may be received by faith. And what is that congregation? The promise of the spirit. Then as we found that the righteousness of God upon his people is the one thing, the only then, the all in all, the fitting up of the people for receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of it at God's will. 
as we have found that that is so, and that is received by faith, then in order to receive the other at all, it must be received exactly as it was, as that was received, that is by faith. Then when God tells you and me, having given us his righteousness, and we having received it gladly, have therefore accepted it in its fullness by faith as God intends us to receive it. And um, it is made our own by Jesus Christ bringing it to us. Then when God tells you and me, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of God is risen upon thee. And when you and I do as God says, and arise by faith in him, he will see that we shine. Congregation, amen. And when he tells you and me that his glory is arisen upon you and me, which is by faith in, of Jesus Christ, then you and I are able are, are to thank him that his glory is risen upon you and me. Thank him that it is so and take our stand deliberately, fairly, openly and candidly and honestly before God under the canopy of angels of God and his glory, which he gives. And then if he does not see that we shine, that is his fault. We need not doubt, but what he will see to that. Now, that message, arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, is as certainly and as distinctly the message of God to you and me, and through you and me as ministers to the people from this day henceforth, as was that message four years ago of the righteousness of God, which is by faith alone in Jesus Christ, congregation, amen. Uh, the speaker, upon request, restated the last proposition. And the people of today who reject this message, which is now the message of today, as they rejected and slighted that four years ago, are taking the step which will leave them everlastingly behind, and which involves their whole salvation. Now, just a comment here. Um, so Jones, of course, is referring to the 1888 General Conference. And when we look at the parallel in this history with our own, we see some very similar ideas that there are groups of people who reject light. And, and, and because they reject light, uh, they're not able to receive further light. Now, this is, of course, a complicated point, because one of the things we know is that not everything that has been uh, understood by different groups, and we can see this in the study we've done in the book of Judges in reviewing the history of this movement, is that we have had many false messages in this movement. And these false messages, just like in the time of the Judges, some of them are enemies from the outside uh, that we have allowed to remain that is, these uh, nations in, in the book of Judges, and they represent messages that occurred in our movement. And, and so um, God raised up messages to counter those messages. But that some people as individuals are discouraged because what happened, we can see also that God gives opportunity again and again for those that have uh, mistakenly um, accepted darkness as light, and those that reject light because it is mixed, mixed with darkness, mixed with error, truth mixed with error. And so God's hand is still out, held out for all. People can close their own probations, but they don't close it because they were um, unwittingly deceived. So God is still holding out his hands to us and offering us uh, his salvation, even if we had rejected light in the past. But we can never do so safely. Um, but we don't want to be left everlastingly behind. Right? So, so we don't want to reject the message, the truth that God has presented God has given us a message and has borne with us these four years in order that we might receive this, which is now the message. 
those who cannot receive that message are not prepared to receive this message because they rejected it, that. So we know this aligns with what Jones had earlier quoted about Ellen White's statements about the first, second, and third angels' messages. Um, so we know that you can't just accept the third angel's message if you have not accepted the first and second. And now when God gives the other in special measure in order that this may be received and both together are slighted, then what can become of those blind eyes? What can become of them? So as, so as we have been called upon to state several times during the Institute and this work, it is a fearful time. Each meeting is a fearful thing. But brethren, though that has been so in the time that is past and of the meetings that are past, this meeting tonight is the most fearful one that we have yet come into. So I turn again to the text and I say again that the message there given to us is the message for you and me to carry from this meeting. And anyone who can carry that message with him from this meeting had better not go. Anyone who cannot go from this meeting with the living consciousness of the presence of Jesus Christ in its power, with his light and his glory upon him and in his life, that minister had better not leave this place as a minister or as a professed minister because he goes to a work that he cannot do. He goes to meet people whom he cannot meet. He goes to meet responsibilities that he cannot meet. He goes to meet solemn scenes that he will not understand. He goes to take steps that he knows not which of the next ones will be to him a fearful one. That is where we are now, brethren and sisters. It is for us now to face it and face it joyously too. It is for us to face it, I say, in all its solemn responsibilities, to face it with all its fearful consequences. But we are to be so prepared by faith in Jesus Christ and clothed with his own righteousness alone, and depending upon that alone, so prepared by this to face it, that we can face it with joy, with the confidence that God goes with us and desires to manifest his power and go joyfully and gladly to meet the scenes that are to be met, to take up the work that is to be taken up and to meet the solemn responsibilities and scenes and actions and occurrences that will come, always gladly in the Lord. That is for us. We need not be a particle discouraged because this is so. We ought to be the gladdest that we ever were in this world, that we are there tonight. Congregation says, Amen. Let me read that text again to get another thought out of it. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory thou shalt see upon thyself. His glory ye shall see in yourself and upon yourself. Congregation, no, no. His glory shall be seen upon thee. Let it. Do not go about superintending that thing. That is none of your business. You are not to regard that matter at all. If it is the glory of the Lord, he will take care that it is to be seen upon you. You would not know that if it was the glory of the Lord, if you should see it upon yourself, because it is not self-glory. When I see glory upon myself, there will be self-glorification. Don't you see? It is not self-glory that we are seeking. It is not self-glory that God is going to manifest to the world. It is the glory of God that he is going to manifest. It is that glory that is going to be seen. Therefore, it says that it means what it says, what it means and means what it says. His glory shall be seen upon thee. Thank him that it is so, for he says so. Thank him that he says so. Then thank him that it is so because he says so. Then let him do it. You have nothing to do with superintending that at all. Just keep yourself out of it. He who undertakes that will lose the whole thing. Don't you see it is the same heart work there? We want righteousness, but so many people want to see it in themselves and upon themselves before they will believe that they have it. Now, I've told a story um, many times about my um, experience in 1987 at uh, 
uh, Malo camp meeting put on by um, um, Ty Gibson and James Rafferty. And there was a, a fellow there who's now an Adventist pastor, a John Whitcomb, and he's actually written a book on um, the third great, the third jihad, it's called, I believe. Um, but at that time, he was with a group called Life Supports that were teaching that, um, that they hadn't been sinning. And so he was at this camp meeting, uh, supposed to be teaching, I think, um, survival stuff. And he wasn't, he was invited on with the condition that he could not teach uh, what, what he believed regarding um, the fact that he had been sinning for a few months. Um, but of course, you know, you get a bunch of uh, conservative Adventists going, hearing about this. And of course, a big meeting happens at his campsite, um, which was actually quite interesting because during that, that camp meeting, or during that meeting at his tent, where, or his camper, where everybody was, um, while that, while he's explaining what he believes, um, a person came running to, uh, to this meeting and, uh, there was, uh, a woman who was demon possessed in the camp, um, which was was rather interesting. Uh, it was a big. I've never told that story. I don't think. Um, but um, but anyway, the, one of the things that uh, helped me is during that camp meeting, uh, because I knew about what this guy was teaching. Uh, for the only time ever in my life, I, I saw myself as sinless. But I knew that it was a deception because I'd been studying Jones and Wagner. And I knew it was just simply, it didn't mean anything. What I saw about myself didn't matter. And what I believe happened is Satan just withdrew all of his attacks, so to speak, and made everything easy. It was just so easy to do good. I would never had it that easy to do good before uh, during that camp meeting. But I knew it was a deception. And that, but people want to have that. They want to see this righteousness in themselves with the belief that um, if they see it in themselves, then it's real. But that's not righteousness by faith. That's righteousness by sight. We will always be looking to Christ and always see ourselves as uh, wretched, uh, helpless, condemned sinners. I can't remember the, if that's exactly the wording Ellen White uses. In the sanctified life. Um, but that's how we will see ourselves. But that doesn't mean that the righteousness of Christ is not upon us. We also can't have that faith and that trust in God if we if we don't see ourselves as righteous. Because if we see ourselves as righteous, then we don't need God. So we only need God if we see our need. If we see our need, then we go to God. Anyway, uh, they never will get it until they put self out of the way, until they turn their backs upon themselves and look at his word. Then when we turn our backs upon ourselves and look upon him, whose glory is and in whom it is, when we look to the place where this glory is, then each one will know from that time that it is his, so long as he looks to the place where it is. We all with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to what? Congregation to glory. Has his glory appeared to us? Congregation, yes. Has it? Congregation, yes. Let me read that, that blessed text in 2 Corinthians. God who commands the light to shine out of darkness. He did it once, didn't he? Congregation, yes. He has done it again. Darkness covered the earth rose darkness. God commanded the light to shine, and it did shine. Again, he says, darkness cover, shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. His light shall be seen upon thee. And therefore, he says, arise, shine, thy light is come. Again, he has commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Congregation, amen. Is that not so? Congregation, yes, he has shined in our hearts. Well, then, he has done it, has he not? Are you saying that, congregation? Yes. I do not mean that you shall say that merely because it is in the text. 
But I want you to say it because in your heart, you know it is so. By that yielding of the will, that submission of the will, that laying all upon him, that is faith. Now then he says so. Now we can go on with this text. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Has he? Congregation, amen. Now can you thank him that he has? Congregation, yes. Anyone who can thank God, that God has shined in his heart, thanks him from the heart. He can thank God that he does not, that he does stand there by faith. He can do this just as certainly as he can thank the Lord that his righteousness is his own. <clears throat> Let us read some more of that verse. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Thank the Lord. What is it for? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Has he given you the light of the knowledge of his glory? The congregation, yes. Has he? Congregation, yes. Has not his glory arisen for you and me? Has not his glory then arisen for, for and upon each one of us and is in each of our hearts? Has the light not shined as God commanded it to shine? We will continue the text. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Then the man who can look with open face into the face of Jesus Christ, who can thank God with his whole heart that the glory of God has risen upon him, then God will see to it that that glory shall be seen upon him. Brethren, that is so, and oh, that every heart in the house tonight might lift his face, unveiled, to that glorious face that shines so gloriously and graciously upon the sons of men and has saved us from our sins and transformed us from glory to glory in his image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And that Spirit has come to those who can look into the face of Jesus Christ. And that Holy Spirit which God gives to those who look into the face of Christ will transform us into his own image. And we shall see his glory reflected and men will see his glory too. Brethren, it is so. And tonight we must receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, of course, we know that that, sec, that uh, passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 um, follows after Moses, right? So he's going to deal with this. Moses was with the Lord that time in the mount. And when he came down, his face shone with the nothing at all. Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone. He did not know anything about it. The people knew about it. Did these people who saw the glory of Moses face have faith? Congregation. No. Moses had faith in order that it might shine. The faith of Moses received it in order that it might shine. And when it did shine from his face, though he was unconscious of it, even the unbelieving people could see it. Stephen stood before the Sanhedrin, men whose hearts were steeled against God and against Christ. But his face shone with the glory of God as it had been the face of an angel. And all they that stood in the council looked upon him and saw it. Did Stephen know it? No. It was not Stephen's glory. He had nothing to do with it. God was there in that presence because that Stephen had such faith in Jesus Christ and was looking with unveiled heart, with unveiled face, by faith into the face of Jesus Christ. And when he did, that glory of the Lord was risen upon him and the heathen and the worse than heathen, the wicked Pharisees, could see the glory of God upon him. We have found in our study that the work today stands exactly as it did when the apostles left it. Well then, when the promise of the Spirit came upon the people in that day, God manifested his own power in his own way, at his own will, upon those who were his. And that is the way he will do it again. Let us read that verse again. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. Don't forget it. Well, how can we forget it? It is so, is it not? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Then we found in the lesson last Friday night 
that we were to obtain the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, by looking into the face of Jesus. And while we look there, receiving that righteousness more and more, being molded more and more into his image, the law of God stands there in all its glory, witnessing that that is the way to look. We found that that was the occupation of the angels also in heaven. Their angels do always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. Well then, brethren, when we go into the company of angels, looking where they look, to receive what they are looking there to receive, and the law witnesses that it is our own, then why shall not that blessed canopy cover us? And that is the covering of God drawn over his people. So then the requisite to this is the faith that lifts up the face to the face of Jesus. And it is not because of our goodness, but because of our need. Now, you know, and I suggest to people to read Second uh, Corinthians chapter 3 um, to understand that more clearly what he's talking about. Um, it says here, by permission of the speaker, Professor Prescott read the following. The hand of the infinite is stretched over the battlements of heaven to grasp your hand in its embrace. The mighty helper is nigh to help the most erring and the most sinful and despairing. Look up by faith and the light of the glory of God will shine upon you. <clears throat> um, so that was Prescott reading that. Um, and Joan says, I did not know that that was there. But brethren, we can be thankful that the spirit of God guides us to, to it here. And do not forget this passage that we have been wanting to get to so long. And now it comes to us, comes in just exactly. Now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have studied this before, that the righteousness of God without the law is manifested by the law. There is another phrase, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. I do not forget for a moment or fail to remember always that where the righteousness of God is, which is obtained by faith of Jesus Christ, the prophets of God will stand in that place and witness to that man that he has the congregation. Amen. That means at this time, for he is coming to us now. So I'm glad that the Spirit of God has led us to it and his way, and his prophet stands and witnesses that that is true and that we have the truth in that thing as it is in Jesus Christ and as shining from his holy face. Uh, by request, the quotation was read again. Okay, now, then, brethren, look up. Then, when we see the signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations, then look up. Lift up your heads, rejoice, for your redemption draweth nigh. Look up, because that comes alone by looking up in the face of him that has said it. We need to look up, for that brings the righteousness, the glory of Jesus Christ, and is it is that glory which makes us immortal. But it is the same glory that consumes. We are to look up. He wants us to look up in order to receive it. And he wants us to look up before that great day in order that we may look upon, look, look up in that day. Now, of course, we can see here when we talk about the signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, we know that the sun and the moon of stars were given for times, for seasons, for days and for years. Um, and we know that this, this is God's timetable, his calendar. But we also see what's happening in the world. And we see that now. But when we're looking up here, what people often think is they're just looking up um, to see, you know, Christ coming in the clouds of glory, which, of course, is that's part of it. But we are also looking up to see, to look into the face of him that has said it. So um, how is it that we come to look into the face of Christ. How, how, do we, how does this happen? What, what do people think this means? 
And what does it mean? Is Jones is 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 getting there? Right, maybe Christ's character. Okay, but how do we see Christ's character? I mean, I can't just look up, you know, physically and see Christ's character. So no, this I don't, mean, I don't mean physically. I don't mean physically look up. I know. So, so, understanding understanding his character. Okay, but where does that come from? What do we look at? According to Jones here. When we see the signs in the sun and the moon and stars, and upon earth distress of nations, then look up. So this is prophecy. We behold Christ in prophecy. Because many people try to behold Christ by you know, using their imagination of what they think Christ is like. You've probably seen this in some Adventist churches where you imagine things about Christ and Christ coming to you and talking to you, which is, of course, uh, spiritual formation. Yeah. Right. So for us to see Christ, to see his glory, that comes from the study of his word and particularly from, from prophecy. How else, how else are we to come to know Christ personally except through his word? Right. But people think that they can just imagine it. You know, they talk of a Christ that they imagine, but they don't find Christ in his word. Right. So, so I mean, this to me has always been the problem with Christianity from the time I remember even looking into it, right? Which I've shared the story about, you know, if Jesus came to my house, that book from the United Church, you know, this little little kid with like a halo around his head. And, and so the, the idea of who Christ is, which we see in the spirit of prophecy, we see in God's word, that has been obscured by by false teaching, but it's also we have no access to the true view of Christ if we do not understand prophecy. We can't know who Christ is without prophecy, without the symbols, without the types, because that's what we are to present to the people. Jesus Christ in types and symbols. Some want to separate, some want to separate uh, prophecy from Christ. Right. So some do, some do. so people say, well, prophecy is not important. <coughs> well, and, and uh, Prescott came to that point. Yeah, Dwight? I, I'll give you another another situation. Okay. Um, over the last several weeks, I have been sharing quite a bit about the importance of numbers as we're finding this within the Bible. Yeah. And the basis that I continue to use is Daniel 8, 13, and 14. Okay. Because who is Palmoni? Well, it's Christ. Of course. But it's also the wonderful numberer. Right. Now, as we're dealing with the wonderful number, does that not mean that numbers are important in prophecy? I mean, the 2300 days would be meaningless without numbers, without the calendar. But with, you know, what we have on the 1843 and the 1850 charts are prominently displayed dates referenced with numbers, right? And all of these are prophetic waymarks. Mm -hmm. Now, as I have been sharing a lot of this, there are those that look at me and they're going, well, you're so focused on numbers. Are you sure this is ju just not numerology? How can it be numerology when you have the 1260, when you have 2300, when you have the seven times, when you start to understand that the land was to rest every seventh year? Why was God being so specific about that? Is that not important for us to understand? 
Mm-hmm. And when they really begin to understand this, when the, when the light clicks on finally, it's like we've never thought of things in this way. Mm-hmm. So all of this prophecy, numbers, every bit of it is concrete. It's not imagination. Mm-hmm. And when we have those that are wanting us to treat this as use your imagination, they're basically saying worship self. Mm-hmm. The devil will give us imagination. <laughs> exactly. Yep. So that's why prophecy is so important. And it also brings, of course, um, it increases our faith, our conviction, and our trust in God. But it still comes by faith, right? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't appeal to man's glory. But yeah, so it's, um, well, when people start to see it, uh, it's, it's very powerful. Okay. So I'm just going to go back here. Now the Lord wants us to look up and he tells us what it is for. Look up and reach up the hand by faith and he will take it. Then let him. Then when God takes that hand of faith, he will hold you and me more securely, securely than we could possibly hold him if we took his hand. You see, it is the same way as we many times lead our own little children along. We hold their hand, and when they stumble, they do not fall. At other times, we have been walking along, and they have had our hand. Then they have stumbled and fallen. Thank the Lord. He says, I will take your hand. Then, though we stumble, we shall not be cast down. Congregation, praise the Lord. Oh, God is good. By request, the following text was read. For the Lord thy God will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Isaiah 41, 13. When he says, I will hold your right hand, oh, let him have it. Then you have no uneasiness at all. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In connection with that, I will read. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What is his glory? Let us be sure of that. Here is a message, which I had some time ago, to which I will refer refer you on page 16 of the bulletin. The work will be cut short in righteousness. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the world to the other. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. So that should be in quotes. But anyway, then that glory is that righteousness, that goodness, that character of his own. Where then do we see righteousness alone, congregation, in the face of Jesus Christ? As we look at that, what effect has it upon us? It changes us into the same image, transforms us into the same image, from righteousness to righteousness, from glory to glory, from character to character, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, will arise and shine because thy light has come. That is the Lord's command. That is why I said before, that is the message from this day henceforth, as certainly as it is received. It is that to us, it is in fact the same thing, as certainly as it was four years ago, only with increased splendor, with increased power. Now, with the accumulated force of four years exercise, God puts it forth to his people. The proposition is again, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Who will? Who will? Numerous voices, I will. Good. Do it. How long will you? Voices, always. How constantly will you? How often will you? Voices always. I tell you, brethren and sisters, those who will do this will find in their lives 
a subduing power such as they never knew before. It will bring that poverty of spirit and that humiliation of soul, which will give the spirit a chance to work in his own wonderful way. And that is where we are. Well then, arise and shine, because the light has come, and the glory of the Lord hath risen upon thee. I will read from page 187 of the bulletin. To him who is content to receive without deserving, who feels that he can never recompense such love, lays all thoughts and unbelief aside and comes as a little child at the feet of Jesus. All the treasures of eternal love are the free and everlasting gift. All these treasures are a free and everlasting gift to us who have nothing with which to obtain it. The Lord says they are mine. I know they are mine too, for he says so. And I am going to thank him all the time. Now there is another splendid text, which we must read that speaks to us now. Isaiah 52, one, awake, awake. Have we been asleep? We have been asleep, have we not? You know that we have. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on what? Strength. We have found by examining the situation in which we stand that we need a power. We need a strength that is greater than all the power that this world knows put together. We have found that we need strength, have we not? Congregation, yes. Then we need it for the message just now. Put on your strength. You have got it. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. What are the beautiful garments? Congregation, righteousness. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. This is the righteousness which comes by faith in Jesus Christ. And here likewise is a word which the Lord addressed to us in this conference. In the bulletin page 408, I read, at this time, the church is to put on her beautiful garments, Christ, our righteousness. Well, then, there it is. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. What is she putting on her garments for? Where is she going? Oh, she is going home. She is going to the wedding supper. Thank the Lord. And the people who went to the wedding suppers in those times had to have garments that were prepared by the master of the feast. And the Lord does the same thing now. Congregation, amen. Brethren, let us all thank the Lord. Let us be thankful all the time. But that is only a part of it. Here's the most blessed promise of it. A blessed promise, it seems to me, that ever came to the Seventh-day Adventist church. For henceforth, there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Thank the Lord. He has delivered us henceforth from unconverted people, from people brought into the church to work out their own righteousness, their own unrighteousness, and to create division in the church. Church trials are all gone, thank the Lord. All mischievous tail bearer, bearers and tattlers are gone. The church now has something better than that to talk about. They can now talk of saving fallen men and women. They will have a goodness and a joy and a holiness and a glory that is in Jesus Christ to talk about, which is real indeed, and we know it. That is a splendid promise. And do you not see how alone it can be filled, be fulfilled? When we go forth from this place, knowing nothing at all but Jesus Christ and him crucified, refusing to know anything but that, refusing to preach anything but that, depending upon his power, depending upon his glory, knowing that it has come and that he has commanded us to shine, then it can be fulfilled. Do you not see that nobody will be drawn to that except those who, who are drawn from the heart and in whom the heart is converted. Do you not see that you yourself will know that they are converted before they are taken into the church? No more shall come into thee, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Now, just to comment on this a little bit. So when I became an Adventist, I didn't become an Adventist through an evangelistic series. I, I didn't go to my first evangelistic series until... Um, I had been an Adventist, well, about a year and a half around there. So a year and a quarter. So it was uh, definitely over a year. And um, 
When I went to the evangelistic series, the one thing I noted is that if I had gone to an evangelistic series, I would not have joined the Adventist church. Now, why do I say that? Well, for the I don't know why. Why? <laughs> well, the simple thing that you would see is what they were presenting was actually appealing to my human nature. It was appealing well, what, to. What was that uh, specifically? Well, the idea that you know, if you sort of become a part of this church, um, you know, everything's going to go wonderfully. You will have um, you you basically set yourself up to be better than others, right? Because you'll be on the, in this special group that knows these truths, that knows, you know, that the Catholic Church, oh, yeah. the Christ. And, and, oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. And so what you see, what I saw with the type of people that came in through evangelistic series is that um, uh, there's a few different types. There's the, some that just want the social group. So, you know, once they're in, if they, once they get, socialized um they stay adventists but pretty much nominal adventists and then there's the ones that come in because of the sensational and and they soon become critical of the church and often leave and go other directions um but the way that i looked at it back then is that you know depending on the type of bait you use it will determine which type of fish you catch and what was not presented was the cross, that is, the cross as self-sacrifice, the idea of suffering, the idea that life is going to be more difficult when you become a Christian. Instead, they presented that life will become easier. And that's not the case. You have before you the death to self has to occur. And so a superficial work would be done and the wrong type of people are brought into the church. That is what Jones is talking about here. Brethren, there is another thing that belongs there now. When God has graced his church with his power and his glory and the power of his spirit, the most dangerous place in this world for a hypocrite is to be in that church. But we have a church that really invites hypocrites, creates hypocrites, Right? Ananias and Sapphira tried it, and that lesson was recorded as a lesson to all people, from this day forward at least. There is no place now in the Seventh-day Adventist Church for hypocrites. If the heart is not sincere, it is the most dangerous place that that man ever was in in the world. Then those who are not going along with this work had better get out quick. Now, what would, do we try to do is we try to keep people in the church. We try to keep our children in the church. We try to entertain people to make the church attractive. Attractive to human nature. And so we end up with the wrong people in the church. And to say that, you know, would the church ever take this position? Uh, you know, if you're not going to get along with, with this work of the cross and what God is asking us to do... You should leave the church now. Do we ever give a message that people should leave the church if they don't like what the church is teaching? If they don't like the cross? We just palliate them. Anyway, it is dangerous to stay here if you are not going along. And we cannot go along without having the glory of God in his light, shining in the heart and in the life. We are to be called to stand before kings and before authorities and to speak against the oppressions and the wickedness of persecutors carrying out their venom against those who would love the Lord. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy, thy neck. It should say thy neck, not thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion. Liberty is now proclaimed to the captives. Praise the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, 
to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Good, that is accomplished. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Then what did he do? Congregation delivered them. Exactly. Then when does this apply? At the time of deliverance. Then we have reached that time, have we not? We have reached the time of oppression. And when that time of oppression has come, then the time of God's wondrous deliverance has come too. So let the oppression become more severe. Let the fire become hotter. It only shows that deliverance is in that, is that, that deliverance is that much nearer. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> Now, therefore, what have I, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. That is so. They have done it already. Therefore, my people shall know my name. What is his name? I am that I am. They will not only know about him, they will know that he is what he is, too, and he is the Almighty. And his people, knowing his name, the all-powerful one, will know his power manifested in them, for them, to them, and through them. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, shall I know in that day that I am he that doth thus speak. Behold, it is I. I am the one that is talking now. Good. Then what? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth, that kings and powers and governors and states, let them exalt themselves as much as they please. God has given you and me a message to the people, thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing. Why, of course, he said long ago, we should sing as we go on the way to Zion. For they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Brethren, while we look into the face of Jesus Christ, and that light shines into our minds and hearts, we need have no trouble at all in seeing eye to eye, even though you are on the other side of the earth and I on this side, <laughs> which of course can be quite literally true now uh, that we can actually uh, sort of physically see eye to eye, uh, wasn't true in Jones' day. There will be that companionship of ideas and truth that will bind our hearts through the center of the earth. God is in it, and that is why it is so. God can make it so. There's no other power in the universe that can make it so. Break forth into joy. Why not? I would like to know. We need not have a special meaning to break forth into joy. It is not necessary to jump up and down and kick over the benches and chairs. It is the joy of the Lord and not fanaticism. It is not a feeling that is wrought up by such demonstrations. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath comforted his people. He has done it, hasn't he? Well, then, let us praise the Lord for his comfort. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm. He is going to do something now. When a man has something to do and begins to roll up his sleeves, you know, it means business. The Lord has taken the familiar figure to show the earnest work he has undertaken. And that applies right now. He has made bare his holy arm. He has rolled up his sleeves. He is entering into a work now that will create a sensation, as in the days of Samuel, when he said to Eli, he will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Let us see that our ears tingle with joy. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Let them, let them. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. That means cut loose from this world, does it, does it not? 
Are you cutting loose? Have you departed? Have you bidden farewell to earth? Congregation, yes. Is the world under your feet? Congregation, yes. Not only is it under your feet, but it is, is it stamped under your feet? I know and you know that when we separate ourselves from all things of this world, God can and does give you and me the consciousness of something that is better than all this world put together. Touch no unclean thing. That is the same word as that used in 2 Corinthians. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord, for ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. No, we are not going to be scared or afraid of anything. He that believeth shall not make haste. He is in no hurry. The Lord never gets in a hurry. But he can take his own good time, and lots of it too. He that believeth shall not make haste. Another translation has it. Shall not be ashamed. Another shall not be confounded. Or not easily put off his balance. And by the way, you will find yourself called to places where there will come a perfect storm of voices and tongues from 20 different sides. And then you do not want to get in a hurry or get off your balance. Then is the time when you are not to be frightened and run away. Oh, no. He has put us in the world to stay there just as long as he wants us here. And ye shall go out with haste. You shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you. And the God of Israel will be your reward. Good. He is the vanguard and the rear guard. I think it actually should be pronounced rear word. But anyway, uh, he is the advance guard and the rear guard also. And that is a good company to be in. Brethren, that is the message now. That is the message that you and I to carry from, from this place. And he who cannot carry it should not go. Oh, do not go as we have been exhorted by the Spirit of the Lord in this place, let no one go without the consciousness of that abiding presence power, abiding presence power of the Spirit of God. No one need go without it, for it is obtained and kept by faith in him, in whose face we look, in order that we may receive the faith of the righteousness of Jesus, that we may be prepared to receive and do receive, the spirit of the God of God by faith. So a very powerful message. I mean, really, this is the answer to the problems that existed in this movement. And so we pray for one another and we pray for ourselves. I know it existed in me. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um so we finished a bit early here but i don't know if i want to go on one is i know i'm tired i know dwight's probably tired but we need to keep one another in prayer we don't know who is watching or who's listening to these videos but we know that there is a power here that God wants to use. And we need his help. Just as Heidi and I had a prayer answered, you know, in our study this afternoon, when as soon as we prayed, there was somebody there because nobody was at the study. We prayed and the person showed up at the door the moment we finished our prayer and we had a good study. But we need Christ to guide and direct. And we need to trust that he is doing a work, even if we cannot see it. We may not see the work in ourselves that he is doing, but we may not even see what he's doing in those around us, what kind of influence we have. We have to trust that to him. So any, any thoughts before we close with prayer? Um, now that, that reference there, William, was that just uh, where we were quoting from? 
or did you want us to look at that? No, it had in there um, where Dwight mentioned imagination. Oh, okay. And I just thought that it, it just happened. I was just reading it while he was talking about it. So I just thought I'd share it. Okay. So that's um, eight testimonies. Yeah, eight testimonies, chapter 13. I, is it seven, page 70.3. Okay, can you read it for us? You got it there? I got to find it again. Okay, well, I can, I can find it here. Um, if you find it, you can read it first. It's just my E.G. White uh, thing is closed, so there it's open now. So you got eight testimonies. That's one three seven zero point three. What does that mean? William, what is that reference? I don't understand that reference. I said it's, chap it's chapter 13. Oh, okay. I see. And I'm sorry, I didn't separate. There's, yeah, yeah, there's just not a space there. Okay. I don't know how you get these chapters there, but so the page is then 70, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, 70.3. 70. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm trying to, I'm struggling to bring it up. Okay. Yeah. So this says, um, seventy point three. Now, therefore, go ye speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now, every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices, and we will every one do the imagination of his evil heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Ask ye now among the heathen who hath heard such things, the virgin of Israel hath, hath done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rock of the, uh, which cometh from the rock of the field, or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Because my people have forgotten, they have burned incense to vanity. They have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in the paths in a way not cast up. So that's Jeremiah eighteen verse eleven to fifteen. Right, I was just looking up ancient paths. I, I was doing some search on a um, thank you, it was the ancient um people and ancient prophets, yeah. and it yeah. just led me to the ancient past. Yeah, but but a people that that says we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart, and that is there's no hope in a person who who has that attitude was chosen evil over good. Okay, well, thanks for that. Let's uh, close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your spirit to work upon our hearts that this Sabbath can truly be a blessing. Bless those that watch these videos and help us, Lord, to, to behold we ask that we can behold the face of Christ, that we can see ourselves as sinners, and that we can trust in his righteousness. Bless each person we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.